So I'll begin with a question uh, which I'd like you to think about in your own minds. What do you need this year? Uh, what obstacle do you need overcome? What problem do you need solved? What relationship do you need reconciled? What uh, goal or desire do you need fulfilled or realized? What do you need this year? Try and think in your own mind. What are the few things that you would put in there? What do you most need this year? And I think behind all of those needs, what I would say is that all of us need Jesus. We need a fresh encounter with the living God. That's what we need. We need our eyes to be turned off the, the petty problems of daily life and our hearts to be captivated again with the glory and the beauty of God, don't we? We need zeal to be ignited in our hearts so that we would have you know, ze uh, passion for other people, sacrificial love towards other people, and that we'd have unconditional obedience and desires for obedience. We need God. Otherwise, we sunk. And our lives kind of degenerate and spiral down into you know, a, a meaningless mess of uh, various empty activities that don't amount to anything significant. I'm right. Am I not? We need God, but how do we get Him? <laughs> how do we get more of Him? And there's many different ways through uh, means through which God makes himself available to us or God ministers to us or God draws near to us different language that the Bible would use. But two of the key means by which we get more of God is prayer and the ministry of his word. His word, the means by which he speaks to us and prayer, the means by which we speak back to him. These two are two key means uh, th through which we have more of God. In one of his books, Wayne Mack calls them the twin pillars of the Christian life. Prayer and the ministry of the word. The twin pillars that hold up our relationship with God and facilitate it so that it grows deeper and stronger. And it is through our relationship that, uh, with God that all these other needs and desires uh, are fulfilled. And so I've called this message prayer and the ministry of God's word. And I want to turn uh, to the Psalms, to Psalm 119, just to consider uh, what this looks like. Because that's what I love about the Psalms. The Psalms don't just give us instruction about God or how to seek God or, or, or how we would seek God in prayer and how his word would minister to us. The, the, the Psalms model it for us. They give us a picture. They show us exactly what it looks like. So Psalm uh, 119 the longest psalm. We're just gonna. We're not gonna look at all of it. We're not even gonna look at half or a quarter of it. We're just gonna look at one stanza, one section of verses, verses 129 to 133. These, this psalm is grouped around the, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet around these eight stanzas or verses that belong together. So we're just going to look at one of them which encompasses a key theme which I've called prayer and the ministry of God's word. So Psalm 119 verses 129. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your law. So eight spiritual needs which are abundantly met through prayer and the ministry of God's word. 
So this is what we need to get, and this is how we get it, through prayer and the ministry of the Word. But what do we need to get? A a glimpse of God's glory, moral clarity, true satisfaction, fresh grace, growing holiness, timely relief, divine blessing, and spiritual zeal. All of these and more are supplied through prayer and the ministry of God's Word. And we'll take each one. Each one relates to a verse in this stanza of the psalm. So the first one there is a glimpse of God's glory, a glimpse of God's glory. Verse 129 says, Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. Wonderful. Um, It's marvelous. It's awesome. It's astonishing. That's the word there. And this is how God is described in Exodus chapter 15. Listen to it, verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? This word goes beyond just standing on a mountaintop and going, wow. And how much do we not need that? How much do we not need every now and then to just break away from daily life and get up onto a mountaintop and see an amazing scenery or marvel at something, stand on the, on the beach and, and look at the shore uh, or stand on the foot of a mountain and just be wowed or a massive tree. All of us understand that sense, that need that we have to, to break away from daily life and be wowed. This word is used seven times in the Psalms always referring to God's wonders, God's miracles, God's mighty acts, the astonishing things that God does that puts himself on display. And, and, and the psalmist here yeah, realizes, I need to be wowed at God, not just at his creation, but at God, his powerful works. You think about it, the parting of the Red Sea, wow. Water coming out of a rock, wow. Wow. The armies of the, of the Egyptians flattened. Wow. Rain coming off the famine. The dead being raised. The sun standing still in the sky at Joshua's command. Wow. These things wow us. But what the psalmist realized here is God's power, God's glory, God's awesomeness, that, that where, where it just astonishes you. That's not just seen in these kinds of powerful acts. Notice what it says there, Psalm 129, uh, Psalm uh, verse 129, your testimonies. Oh, wow. We open up God's word, and it is the revelation, the clearest revelation of his glory and his goodness and his beauty and his awesome power. This is where we encounter the wow. When last have you opened your Bibles? And had that. Are you seeking it? Is that what you're wanting? Is your approach to God's word a kind of, you know, I need need to just get this out of the way. I need to get through my readings for the day. uh, And so I can tick the box off. Is it something that just must be done or something you get to every now and then? Or do you go expecting when when you open this word, power? is manifest for you to, be, you to see and be wowed by. That's what we should be seeking, a glimpse of God's glory as we open his word. That's what we need. As Moses was, was uh, being commissioned and equipped to lead God's people out of Egypt into the promised land, what was his request? We saw that from Frank a few weeks back. What? Show me your glory. He realized, God, I need to get a a glimpse of your awesomeness, your power, your greatness, your your manifest awesomeness. Isaiah, as he was being called and equipped uh, uh, to minister to God's people, what did he need? He saw this vision in Isaiah 6 of God uh, in holy array in the temple and, and the seraphs around him crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God knew for him to do the work that he was being called to do, he needed to do it with a big view of God, uh, a view of God's awesomeness. As Jesus prepared his disciples uh, to face the horrors of the cross, what did he give them? A glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfigurations. They needed to be wowed by who Jesus was. And as God closes his revelation to his church, 
And He needs to give us what we need to live out for His glory until He returns. What does He give us in the book of Revelation? Not eschatology primarily, not how things will wrap up. The revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Jesus knows that the last word to us is the word about, see my glory, be wired by my power, see who I am and what I'm able to do. This is what we need above all things. And we receive this through prayer and the ministry of God's word. Second, moral clarity. Moral clarity in verse 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. The unfolding of God's word gives understanding, gives light, gives wisdom. Some translations uh, say the entrance or the opening of God's word because the Hebrew uh, could refer to a door. So in other words, it's like uh, this world is dark and difficult and confusing and God's word is like a door. And when we open this door on the other side, light comes rushing through, glory comes rushing through, and we can see where we must go and what we must do. That's the picture here. It sheds light on our darkness. God's word gives wisdom. It gives insight. It gives understanding. That's why it says there, it imparts understanding even to the simple. It even allows the simple-minded. We battle to grasp big concepts. You don't need a degree. You don't need to be a genius. You don't have to have a doctorate in psychology or social sciences to be able to figure out what's right and wrong in relationships and in life. Even the simple, even the uneducated, every ordinary man and woman and young person who opens God's word believing is going to receive their Wisdom, knowledge, truth, understanding that will help us live out our lives for God's glory. That's what this is saying. The world is full of books, right? Which offer help on just about every subject imaginable. Uh, Google estimates over 130 million different books. So you would have to read nearly 5,000 books a day to get a handle on the world's Uh, advice in a lifetime. You think about that. If you're going to live your life by worldly wisdom, you are way, way behind the curriculum. (laughs) But the Christian has one book, and in it is contained all of God's wisdom necessary for life and godliness. We just need to open this book and study and understand and seek to gain God's mindset contained therein. And there will be no problem, no issue, no relationship, no situation that we find ourselves in that we won't know what to do. I've often thanked God for that in ministry. You know, you go and you do ministry, you get equipped for ministry at some Bible school or whatever, and then you face all kinds of problems in the church. You basically import everyone's problems in all their different stages of life. And I've never found myself not knowing what to do. Because I can always go back to one source of authority, one source of truth, and there seek. In my own wisdom, often finding myself not knowing what to do. But knowing if I just go back to this word, there'll be light. Do you consult this book? See, many many churches and Christians treat this like a magic charm kind of thing, that you just read it and somehow power comes. Or they treat it like a ritual. You just read it, you know, in order to tick off your religious rituals. Or they treat it like some sort of potion that you can take and have an experience of God. But in reality, this book is the means by which we gain God and His wisdom and His mindset. And in fellowship with this, we get transformed for everyday life. This book tells us how to be better fathers and mothers, how to be better husbands and wives, how to live fruitfully and successfully in a broken world, how to be better employers and employees, how to drive better, how to live better, how to eat better, how to think better, how to sleep better. 
This book relates to every part of our life. And we get transformed into God's image. We understand how life works as we seek to understand this book and walk in its light. It's a very practical, necessary book for every part of our life. We go back here, and it's the how-to of everything that is important. Third, true satisfaction. True satisfaction. Verse 131. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. The picture is clear, isn't it? What comes to my mind is uh, those little chicks in a nest, in a bird's nest, and their mouths are just open as they've been born into this world and they can't get enough of food and they're just waiting for mom to come and their beaks are open and mom just deposits the food in there so they can be nourished and satisfied. That's the picture. The psalm is saying, that's how he is. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. I'm hungry. I need this, this nourishment. He's panting, he's longing for God's word. There's no doubt in his mind where true spiritual substance comes from, right? This is what he needs for life, for sustenance, for satisfaction, for everything. This is totally opposite to, Lord, I I better spend time in God's Word. I'm behind in my Bible readings. I haven't opened the Bible for X days. (sighs) Can I find 10 minutes? This is not the attitude here. We've all been there, right? We all know what that's like. Where God's Word seems empty and boring and dry and unsatisfying and For days we just go without it and we don't feel like we've lost anything and then we feel guilty so we go and read it a bit just out of guilt not because we think we're going to get anything there and you read through a couple of minutes and it feels like four hours. We've been there. Why? We're reading God's word with the wrong attitude and often we're feeding on the world more than the word. What is the golden rule of food? You all, you've all learned it from a young age. No sweets before supper. Don't tell me you haven't heard that. No sweets before supper. That was the golden rule in many households anyway. The second golden rule is like it. And that is, if you don't finish your supper, no sweets. Right? That's healthy diet. Why? Because we know that children are going to binge on sweets and then they won't have an appetite for what's really nourishing. We know that good food doesn't always taste wonderful in the moment. You need to develop a taste for nourishing food. And we know that if you don't develop that in a child, they might delight in that savory, sweet taste for the moment, but in the long run, they're going to be struggling with all kinds of health issues because they're not getting the nourishment they need. And yet we know if we've been trained in these rules of food, right, as you get old as an adult and, and you've been kind of going to McDonald's and you know, just having a, a bit of you know, snacks here and there, what do you long for? Just a, just a hearty meal. Just to sit down and have, you know, a whole, a lot of different foods down there and eat your full and feel that, that deep satisfaction. We all know as adults what that's like. We've learned, we've trained our bodies to, to recognize what's really good for it and to enjoy it. I think some of us are finding God's word dry and empty and rusty and dusty because we are disobeying the, the rules, the golden rules of food, and we, we're binging on sweets, we're binging on social media, we, we're binging, binging on the world and magazines and television and um, things that just distract us and delight us in the moment but don't supply any real nourishment. Many of us are, are spending more time in all these frivolous entertainments that the world has to offer and then we, we're not getting, we don't have the appetite left for God's word. And that's the problem. And it's leading to ill health. So he has a simple little application. Try simple commitments like this. No TV until I've read my Bible. No, no Facebook, no social media, no YouTube. 
no exercise, no eating. <laughs> we could just make simple commitments like that to prioritize God's Word because we recognize we need it. And as we come to it, it's not just to get it out the way, it's to say, God, this is the real nourishment for my soul. I'm finding it dry. I'm finding myself full of these, these sweet delicacies from the world. Feed me with your word. Like the psalmist says, nourish me, produce in me this hunger and this desire and this deep satisfaction that comes from fellowshipping with you around your word. If you're a believer, you've had some of that too. Where you felt empty and dry and unable to cope and then you've just spent some time with the Lord around His Word and you've left soaring, running, flying. You know that God is able to use His Word to minister. Fourthly, fresh grace. Fresh grace. Verse 132. Turn to me and be gracious to me as is your way with those who love your name. Turn to me, be gracious to me, give me more of yourself. And the picture here is that God, for some reason, has sort of turned away from him or is turning away from him. He's not experiencing intimacy with God. He is experiencing this dryness. He feels like God has turned away and is somehow distant and unconcerned. And so now his appeal is, God, turn to me. Turn, turn back. Don't go. Don't wander off. Give me your attention. Following verses 131, he's not just wanting more of God's word. He's not just wanting teaching. He's wanting God. Turn to me. You, God, my God, turn to me. That's what we're seeking in God's word. Not just instruction, not just wisdom, not just truth, not just what must I do, a how-to manual. We're seeking a person. Turn to me, God. Be gracious to me. Fresh grace. Give me what I haven't earned and don't deserve. That's grace. When we make appeals to God, when we seek things from God, we never deserve it. We need God to give us. That's grace. God giving us what it is that we need most in this moment, in this hour, that we don't deserve and never will. Fresh grace. In some translations there it says, as is your way with those um, who love your name. Some of them say, as is the right. Uh, uh, some say God, uh, he's not asking God to give him, he's saying, as is the right of those. And it's an interesting language. It's almost like he's saying, this is our right. But he's just asked for grace. I thought we haven't deserved this. So how can he say this is our right? Well, he's basing that on who God is. He's come to understand that for those who seek God, God's character is to be gracious. God has made promises that those who seek Him will find Him. Those who want Him will have Him. Those who recognize their need of Him and His power will experience it in abundance. He's come to recognize this about God. And that's why he can talk about, give me grace, I don't deserve it. And yet, in a way, because of your promises, because of your character, because of who you are, this is the right of all those who seek them. We can confidently expect that God will give us more of himself. There's boldness here. It's the right that is mine by promise rather than by performance. That's the difference. It's what is mine by promise rather than performance. It's not my right because of what I've done or because of who I am or because of how hard I've tried. It is my right because of who you are and what you've done and how much you've done for me. He's like a blind man grabbing hold of Jesus' garment and clinging to it and saying, Jesus, give me sight. I'm not letting go until I have sight from you, because you're the only one who can give it. That's the picture here. But he's asking for God. A glimpse of glory, moral clarity, true satisfaction, fresh grace. We've got to realize we need grace every day. Yesterday's grace is not for today. We need today's grace. We need God today. 
And tomorrow, and our fears about tomorrow, we can worry about those when tomorrow becomes today. For today, we need God. And we can have Him. Fifth, growing holiness. Growing holiness. Verse 133, Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Or like the NHB says, Establish my steps according to your word. So he's asking God, help me to keep walking according to your word. There's a right path here, a path that your word lays out, but help me. You see, the Christian life is not as easy as, oh, well, God commands that, so do it. No. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now do it. Oh, that's easy. No. We, we need God to help us walk in the right path. And to protect us from going astray. We can't even do that much. It's not just that we need knowledge and understanding. We need grace and power operating to help us every step of the way. We need God to take our hand and help us walk in the right way. And that's what he's saying here. Keep steady my steps. You know, he's like a, a, a child that's just learning to walk. You understand the weakness. I know this is the way I should go, but I also know I can't get through this day. I can't walk this path. I can't do what you require because I'm too weak and unable. Steady me. Take my hand. Lead me. And you know if you've got a young child how that works sometimes, especially if you're going up a mountainside. It's kind of like you're holding their arm and they're just dangling there doing the motions, but you're carrying them all the way through. Because if you let go, they'll fall. D.L. Moody said this. He said, the Bible will, will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. We need God's Word to guide us in the right way. We need God to help us in this way. We need to be in prayer in the ministry of God's Word to walk in the right way and to protect us from the wrong way. We need to make a daily decision like the psalmist says, God, lead me along this pathway. Because the more we walk this pathway, the further we get away from God and His Word. The more lost we get, the more difficult the pathway gets, the harder it is to find our way back home. You're either going to be meditating on, thinking about, and planning in accordance with God's Word. You're either going to be thinking about God's Word, or you're going to be meditating on, thinking according to, and planning sin. We're not neutral. We don't think neutral thoughts. We don't live neutral lives. We either direct our lives towards God and His Word or towards sin. Sin is either graining a foothold, and that's why He's saying, let no iniquity gain dominion over me. There's a war to be fought every day against iniquity, and it's a powerful enemy. And it's got the remnants within that draw us, and there's Satan and the world on, out, on the outside that work with this remnants of sin inside, and that's a powerful potion. So that if you stop meditating on God and His Word and asking for His help the whole time, you will quickly move off down the wrong path. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh, yeah, and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We need God and His Word because that's what the Spirit uses us to establish us in righteousness. You're not going to be able to overcome sin if you live a life void of prayer and Scripture. You will not be able to overcome the sin in your life that will ultimately dominate and rule and destroy and make you miserable unless your life is full of prayer and the ministry of God's Word. You need these means of grace to overcome sin. D.A. Carson, the commentator, said this, People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, or obedience to Scripture, towards faith and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience 
and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. It's true. Many Christians struggle with habitual sin, with sins that tempt them constantly, harass them, overcome them, demoralize them, threaten to dominate them. These won't be thrown off apart from prayer and the ministry of God's Word. Look, at, look how the psalm is unfolding here. Look how these two belong together. Just notice here, he keeps asking, he keeps praying. He's using God's Word as the basis for his praying. At verse 132, turn to me. 133, keep me. 134, redeem me. 135, let your face shine upon me. Right? There's this constant requesting, God, make this living, make this true. He, he keeps making these appeals that God would supply. But then notice what's also in these wor wor verses at the same time. 129, your testimonies. 130, your words. 131, your commandments. 133, your promise. 134, your precepts, your statutes, your law. You see how these go together? God telling us who He is and what He desires and, and, and what we need to trust Him for and what we need to do and us speaking and asking for fresh grace and power and ability, asking God to make Himself known to us and fellowship with us and be intimate with us and these things go together. In prayer I speak to God and in Scripture God speaks to me. This is the relationship we have with Him and how it's worked out. And by spending more time with God, with Jesus, in and around His Word, we become more like Him. Sixthly, timely relief. Timely relief, verses 134. Redeem me from man's oppression. Now the oppression's changing here from the oppression of the, the dominion of iniquity to the, the, the oppression of man. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. God, he's got a problem that's also concerning the horizontal world he lives in, the people that are around him, the oppression of the wicked, and he wants deliverance from them. And notice the, the pattern running through these ver verses. He's saying, your word is wonderful. I want to keep it. It's light. I want to walk in it. It brings grace. I want to love you for it. It's power that I might walk in victory over it. Yeah, it's not the word of God that brings deliverance. God brings deliverance. But the Word of God comes as the fruit of that. So the deliverance is, uh, the Word of God is not the foundation of its deliverance, it's the fruit. He wants God to deliver him from oppression so that, he, so that he might walk in godliness, that he might follow God. It's difficult to live in a fallen world. And there's times when we need deliverance, we need protection, we need God's intervention just to be able to live out our Christian faith in this world. And the psalmist is yeah, modeling that. John Calvin said about this verse, We are taught from this passage that when engaged in contest with the wicked, we ought not to suffer our minds to be actuated by malice, but that however violently and unjustly they may assault us, we should rest contented with the deliverance which God bestows, and in which we experience the grace of God in delivering us. That should spur us on to incite us to follow after uprightness. He delivers us for no other end but that the fruits of our deliverance may be manifest in our life. And are we too perverse that if that experience is not sufficient to convince us that all who persevere in the unfeigned fear of God will always abide in safety by His aid, although the whole world may stand against Him? Big words, fancy language. He's saying this, we need God to deliver us from these horizontal problems. And we need to wait upon God, to seek God for His deliverance so that we can walk in His ways. God understands that, right? God understands that there are some problems that are beyond our solving. 
And what Calvin is saying, this verse teaches us, we don't have to always fix the horizontal problems ourselves. We don't always need the vengeance. We don't always need the justice. We don't always need the political solutions. We can trust in God's deliverance, who's able to work in all these arenas for our deliverance. God is able to deliver us. He doesn't always deliver according to our time and our schedule in the way that we want, right? And normally when we seek our own deliverance in our own means, it goes awry. Yeah, the psalmist is saying, God, you deliver me that I might keep your precepts, walk in your ways. He doesn't always bring relief when we think we need it. But he always brings relief when we need it. He doesn't always bring relief when we think we need it. But he does always bring relief when we need it. So here's the point. Yeah, we see that the psalmist is seeking God for the deliverance from oppression, from difficulties, from obstacles on a horizontal level. Now, when we're face, facing oppression and difficulties and obstacles and life is getting really hard to bear, what do we do normally? We run. We run from God. We run from His people. We avoid Him. We're just too busy with all these other problems that we need to solve. We're too busy trying to get solutions to all these horizontal problems. There's just no time for God. Isn't that true? How often have we not said, it's things have just been so hectic at work or so difficult at home. I've just been going through such a trying time. And that's a reason for us to abandon God and His Word, to, to, to fall into prayerlessness and, and scripturelessness. And yet it's just the opposite thing we should be doing. The harder the problems are getting, the more we should be running to God and His Word and getting nourishment there and having our faith strengthened there and there asking God to resolve these horizontal problems that are burdening me beyond what I can bear. Martin Luther is famous for commenting, I have so much to do today that I'm going to need to spend three hours more in prayer in order to be able to get everything done. Paraphrase slightly. Maybe you didn't even say that's a good quote. <laughs> Divine blessing. Divine blessing, verse 135. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. The phraseology comes from, or the phrase comes from, Numbers 624. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is the blessing, the ironic blessing that uh, the priest would stand in front of all the people and bless the people with um, when they came to worship and make their sacrifices. Also found in Psalm 31, 67, three times in Psalm 80. Very similar to verses 132, turn to me and be gracious to me. Very, very similar kind of idea. But I think what's slightly different here, make your face to shine upon it. And yeah, it's God's face, God's presence that the psalmist is seeking. He wants God to be near to him. Make your face shine upon you. Now this is important to get in our culture where so many churches and Christians are seeking God to bless them with other things. God is just a source, uh, you know, like a, a means of getting other blessings. But here in this psalm, God is the blessing. God's presence, God's face, God's nearness God's companionship is the blessing that he's seeking. He's just not wanting, he's not using God to get some better thing. No, he's seeking God as the better thing. We all know what it's like when you go away from loved ones and you miss them and you long for them and then you get home and you just have this amazing welcome and their face lights up. You've seen that, right? The delight. Their face lighting up. That's the idea Yeah, God, delight in me. I want to see your face light up. I want to delight in you. Intimacy, favor, God's pardon, God's presence. This is what we need. We have daily devotions because we want to encounter the living God. We want to fellowship with Him, the most important person in the universe. He's, just, he's not just a means to an end. So eight spiritual needs which are abundantly met through prayer in the ministry of God's word. A, gl <coughs> a glimpse of glory, moral clarity, true satisfaction, fresh grace, 
growing holiness, timely relief, divine blessing, and the final one is spiritual zeal, there in verses 136. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. And yeah, the psalmist is not lukewarm when it comes to things that dishonor God in the world around. Things that are not right. Things that are contrary to God's will and character and way. This is not just about a personal relationship and it ends there. I love where the psalm ends. It doesn't end in me just enjoying God and, and God enjoying me. It ends with that then giving him a, a look outward and him seeing in the world what is not wrong, what is not right. All that is wrong, all that is unjust, all that is evil, all that is contrary to who God is and His will and His ways and His purposes and His plans. And the psalmist now, having fellowship with God and being intimate with God and having God, now he looks at this world in which he serves God and he sees it as God does. And he feels about it like God feels about it. And his eyes are streaming with tears. And I think there's some poetic license here. But we get the idea. I'm broken. I'm grieved. I mourn. I'm burdened by all that I see around me that is contrary to your glory and your goodness. That's the product of prayer and the ministry of God's Word. We are then have the right attitude and perspective and emotions and desires and will and zeal to go into this world where we, we're called to live out our lives and serve God there with zeal and passion. That's what's expressed here. He's not lukewarm. He's not sitting on the fence. He's not distracted by other things. He's burdened. You burdened for the lost. Those who don't know, Lord. Are you burdened for broken families? orphan children, lost family members? Are you burdened by the injustices around and the brokenness with people having no light? Are you burdened by wickedness? Do you hate sin, not in the self-righteous kind of way where you think you feel you're better than other people, but where you see sin around, do you realize that you're the same and it grieves you? Does this burden you, the brokenness of this world? To the point where you want to be God's instruments for change. You want to be that gospel carrier, that healing balm, that friend who comes alongside and encourages. Do you want to bring God's light into this dark world because you sense how dark it is without Him? So much more clearly having fellowship in His light. I know I did a leadership course with a a pastor named Jerry Rag, and I remember clearly he said, if you want to be a minister of God and be pursuing holiness and be a worthy vessel, then get used to brokenness. Get used to brokenness. Because at the end of the day, fellowshipping, fellowshipping with God produces in us a deep brokenness, a pain, a hurting, a humility over our sin and the sin that's all around that's what it produces, grieving, because things are not as they ought to be. And that, from that arises a desire to trust God and to serve Him. So let me close by ending where we started. What do you need this year? What do you most need this year? You need Jesus. You need to be devoted to prayer and to the ministry of God's word. You need to give yourself to this in practical means to commit to this ministry because you need a fresh encounter with the living God. Because you need your eyes to be turned away from the petty problems of everyday life and you need to catch a glimpse of the beauty and your heart to be lifted up and enthralled again with the glory and the goodness of God. You need zeal to be ignited in your heart so that you pursue radical obedience and sacrificial acts of love and devotion to others so that your life doesn't spiral down into this kind of meaningless mess of a whole lot of empty activities that amount to nothing. 
you need Jesus, you need more of him, and you can have more of him in and through the ministry of his word. Because remember, we live beyond the psalmist. We live in the light of further revelation where John could tell us this word who was with God and who was God, who was in the beginning with God, this word became flesh and he dwelt among us and he came full of grace and truth. This word was embodied in a person, Jesus Christ, who died for your sin and conquered sin and death on your behalf and was raised to the right hand of God and who is ever living as the Lord of the universe. This word points us to Jesus, the living word. And it's in fellowship with him that we have all that we need and all of God's goodness toward us is realized. So we're going to close our service in a, a time of singing and just use this time to commit yourself, to ask for God's grace and his help, um, to be devoted to seek Jesus in prayer and through the ministry of his word.